Hi, this is Dr. Dan Sullivan, and this presentation is Optimizing Electronic Medical Record Workflow to Reduce Medical Errors and Provider Frustration. Hi, I'm Dr. Dan Sullivan. I'm the President and CEO of the Sullivan Group, a leader in risk management, patient safety, and quality improvement solutions for healthcare providers. I am a board-certified emergency physician, a fellow in the American College of Emergency Physicians, and an associate professor of emergency medicine at Rush Medical College in Chicago, Illinois. I am an expert in building risk management, patient safety, and evidence-based medicine seamlessly inside of electronic medical records. The Sullivan Group's EMR risk management module is currently in place in over 500 United States hospitals. So let's review the learning objectives for this presentation. I want to create an awareness of the current state of the union as it applies to patient safety and practitioner frustration when using electronic health records and electronic medical records. I want you to understand the impact of electronic health record technology on patient care. And then I'd like to share ideas on optimizing workflow inside of EMRs and EHRs in order to make our patients safer and, very importantly, to reduce practitioner frustration. And so I've got an image here on the screen, uh, and um, it pretty much sets out the nature of the problem. What do you see? You see a bunch of practitioners sitting at computers. Uh, they shouldn't be sitting at computers. They should be working with their patients in a very small fraction of their time spent working on their computers. Well, we have some recent research on the subject, uh, and here is one, uh, I like to call this one, Death by 4,000 Clicks, a Productivity Analysis of Electronic Medical Records in the Community Hospital. This is a recent publication, and um, here is the data from, from the, that research. Uh, and it pretty much nails the problem down. The data entry for practitioners are spending 44% of their time on data entry and 28% of their time on patient contact, which is just not acceptable. Uh, and uh, the systems need to change to get the practitioners back to the bedside. 4,000 mouse clicks per shift per doctor. I just played around with some calculations that, um, that, were, that were in that article. 4,000 mouse clicks per shift per doctor. A click takes a second, 66 minutes clicking per shift per doctor. Two doctors per shift, 365 days per year, 803 hours spent clicking. Let me tell you, practitioners want to stop clicking. They want to stop scrolling. They want something that is built for them that will get them through a shift, get them back to the patient's bedside. At 2.1 patients per hour, 1,686 patients could have been seen, or they could have spent a whole lot more time at the, at, at the patient's bedside. If it's cash that's involved here, this is a very expensive proposition. So something really has to change. I wanted to show a couple of articles that are recent. This one, an allocation of physician time in ambulatory practice. It's a time and motion study in four specialties uh, in ambulatory practice. And, uh, you know, pretty much I just wanted to give you verbatim what they found. The participants, 57 United States physicians in family medicine, internal medicine, cardiology, and ortho, who were observed for 430 hours. 20 of them also completed after-hours diaries. Now, it's sad that there are even such things as after-hour diaries for working on EMRs and EHRs, um, but that was the subject of this research. Measurements, proportion of time spent on four activities, direct clinical face time, EHR time, desk work, administrative task, and other tasks a task is self-reported uh, and self-reported after hours work. During the office day, very similar to the emergency medicine report, this one in ambulatory care, physicians 27% on the total time on direct clinical face-to-face. -face. Ridiculous. 49.2 on EHRs, very similar to the other, um, to the other study. And, and that is the state of the union. Uh, the folks are spending 
way too much time, they're frustrated, uh, and they're not spending enough time at the bedside. What a huge risk issue that is. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a cause of perhaps not getting enough data. It's a cause of perhaps prematurely closing, anchoring, uh, and not getting enough data to make the right diagnosis. So clearly, this is a risk and safety issue. The 21 physicians who completed after-hours diaries report one to two hours of after-hours work. Can you imagine spending 49.2% at the job and then going home and spending one to two hours at your home when you're supposed to be eating dinner or being with your family? The source of frustration for, for practitioners. So AHIMA has come out with a recent report uh, talking about physicians' use of electronic health records, and they reported 74 to 90 percent of physicians use the copy-paste function in their EHRs. Now, you have to know from what we've heard in recent years, copy-paste is a serious problem. 20 to 78 percent of physicians' notes are copied text. Uh, and that's just, again, not acceptable. You need to individualize. Uh, there has to be variability in what those charts look like. And if there isn't, it's a problem. It's a problem with CMS. It's a problem with the Office of the Inspector General. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, together with Attorney General Eric Holder, are telling the industry, we've got problems here. We've got gaming the system possibly to obtain payments to which they are not entitled. So this is obviously a huge issue, and, but I am here to tell you that the problem is not gaming the system. The problem is practitioners trying to work with electronic medical records and electronic health records that were not built by them and for them. They don't, they don't have workflow built in. They don't have clinical decision support built in. They take tons of scrolling, typing, and clicking, and people are not happy with them. So these folks are not trying to get more money. They're just trying to get home to their families and be able to play with their children. There's been a uh, c combined report from American Medical Association and RAND, Factors Affecting Physician Professional Satisfaction, you know, right on the subject of this, of this presentation their professional satisfaction and, and implications for patient care, health systems, and health policy. And I was going to create a, 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 a PowerPoint slide here, and then I thought, I'm just going to show you the index. Because there's an entire chapter seven that is devoted to electronic health records inside this presentation on physician professional satisfaction. And what we've got here is we've got a little improvement uh, EHRs facilitate better access to patient data. Uh, a little bit more improve professional satisfaction. It improves some aspects, and let me underscore some aspects of quality of care and better communication with patients. And, and I know I'm on a uh, I'm on a portal, and uh, there absolutely is better communication. It's great. On the other hand, look at worsened professional satisfaction, time-consuming data entry user interfaces that do not match clinical workflow, interference with face-to-face -face care, insufficient health information exchange, information overload, mismatch between what the government calls meaningful use criteria and what the physicians know to be good clinical practice, EHRs threaten practice finances, EHR require physicians to perform lower skilled work, all 47% of the time or 49% of the time spent working on EHRs. This completely, it's a completely untenable and unacceptable situation. In part, this is related to the High Tech Act. What did it do? Um, it was created to stimulate the adoption of electronic health records. I'm um, sorry, that's supposed to be EHR, not HER, uh, and supporting technology in the United States. And uh, so if you implemented an electronic health record, you got money to help you implement. Uh, and in order to sort of steer the course in that implementation, the government came up with regulations describing meaningful use. Well, all right, well, what's meaningful use? I want to focus just on this first bullet point. Meaningful use is using certified electronic health record technology to improve quality, improve safety, improve efficiency, 
and reduce health disparities. Now, from what I've told you so far, do you think that there is efficiency uh, and reducing health disparities in the medical records? So let, let's, let's move on to quality and safety. Medical errors are the third leading cause of death. Uh, it's incredible. And, uh, and, and, and how can we avoid them? You know, here, here, here's the list. Heart disease is number one, cancer number two. Now, you may argue that you disagree with this, this publication, and maybe it's the second most frequent, maybe it's the fifth most frequent. But the fact that medical errors is on this list at all is incredible. And, and so uh, it is my opinion that the, uh, that the highest level of attention and focus of today's electronic health records and electronic medical records should be quality and should be patient safety. With this level of medical errors, the, the big companies responsible for the, for the installation of, of enterprise electronic health records should have a, a specific focus on this. And I am telling you, they don't. Um, I know the companies, uh, big and small, and that, that simply has not been a focus of these organizations. Sure, they can point to a couple things, but believe me, they do not have a team of practitioners internally who are working on how do we make this better and faster for practicing physicians? How do we build clinical decision support inside? How do we get the evidence-based medicine to them real time while they're taking care of their patients? It, it's just not happening. And so I offer this image from Caroline LaPlante. Thank you, Carolyn, for your permission to use it. Uh, I use it to say that we're crawling out of the ooze. We are the generation who, because of high-tech meaningful use and electronic health records, because they've moved in so quickly with so little attention to practitioners, we are, we are, we're crawling out of the ooze. We are the first of our, of, of our kind. Uh, and I hope that my daughter, who is an emergency physician, can have an experience with EHRs that's very different from mine and, and my colleagues. And I consider her the electricity was supposed to help so much. The promise of the electronic medical record and the electronic health record is largely a promise unfulfilled. And I'm telling you that it is a time for change. It is a time for these companies to get focused and stay focused on issues related to quality, safety, and to workflow. And one of our opportunities, and I've done this before in these presentations with Excel Catlin, is, um, is human factors engineering. Now, there are certainly other things. There are other systems that need to be dealt with, but this one is huge. What is it? Human factors engineering is a multidisciplinary field incorporating contributions from psychology, engineering, industrial design, graphic design, statistics, operations, and anthropometry, which I will address in just a minute. But basically, this is the coming together of the measurement of the human being and an understanding of how he and she work and putting it together with information technology to make a product which is way better than one plus one way better than one plus one, and we're just simply not there yet. Anthropometry, by the way, technically is the measurement of the human being. Uh, in this instance, it's the measurement of our cognitive abilities and how they interact with information technology. So I want to throw out, so that's the state of the union, and that is the state of EHRs and EM EMRs. They relate to quality, very little is built in, and patient safety, very little focus. Uh, I want to throw, I want to give you now some examples just to get your wheels turning around the opportunities to build using human factors engineering uh, to build into electronic health records and, e and, and EMRs the ability to improve workflow, the ability to take better care of our patients, the ability to avoid medical errors and build in quality and evidence-based medicine. So let's start here as a very simple example, but it's a huge opportunity. We looked at uh, a group in, in this study, which we published, we looked at 90,000 patients, 9,000 had a very abnormal vital sign, and 16% of patients with abnormal vital signs were discharged without a single repeat. So that's a problem. 
very abnormal vital signs going home at a rate of 16% of patients who presented with them. This is a common finding in failure to diagnose cases. This is a common cause of morbidity and mortality, and we need to make that go away, not just in emergency medicine, in all aspects of medicine. So we're going to do some human factors engineering. What's the problem? Here's an emergency department. It's busy. It's five to three. You can see people are even, you know, they're moving so fast they're blurred in this image. Uh, so the physician wants to discharge, and the nurse, and the nurse, uh, he says discharge, and the nurse never communicates anything about the vitals. They don't have a discussion, and off the patient goes. So we know how that works. We know that in the practice of emergency medicine, ambulatory care medicine, urgent care, freestanding, the, our problem is the failure to diagnose. Where there are medical errors, the problem is the failure to diagnose. They're particularly expensive, and they are, they are dead on ongoing monitoring of clinical status. This is the vital sign issue. You can see it. You can see that it's common. You can see that it's expensive. And so what do we do? We just put our heads together with the machine and figure out a better way to go. So every time there is any exposure to the tracking board or a chart, there is an ongoing immediate availability of the patient's vital signs. If you're here on the tracker or if you're on the chart, if you're the physician or if you're the nurse, everybody sees it all the time. And when I decide to make a disposition on my patient, and there is a pulse of 120, or the nurse hits dispo, she or he knows that the pulse is 120, that immediately gets communicated. This stops the problem. This huge national problem with abnormal vital signs goes away with this simple solution. I don't plan on giving everything away that the Sullivan Group works on. I just wanted to get your wheels turning. This solves the problem. Here's another one, extremity lacerations. Not our biggest loss uh, in emergency medicine or ambulatory care. Not our biggest patient safety issue. Uh, but I just think it's a great example, so I wanted to share it with you. You know, our big issues are failure to diagnose MI, thoracic aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. But extremity lacerations are, you know, it's a dime a dozen. It's garden variety. It's what we do all day, every day. And so when you analyze those medical errors and that litigation, what do you see? We miss vascular injury, neurologic injury, and we miss tendon injury. And why? Because we don't want to do that. We don't want to miss these things. But it's because we're human. And we need help to do a great job. We can't remember. We can't rely 100% on human memory. Uh, and it gets worse as you get older, let me tell you. So... If we're doing, dealing with a laceration on the hand, let's think about what we need to help us do a fantastic job, the highest quality job possible. Now, we're in a, we're in a, a template for a laceration, and it's on the hand. We've got to say that vascular is good, and we want to say neurologic is good. Cap, capillary refill is easy. You know, just push the finger and see if the blood comes back. Distal motor is good. Motor is easy. Just move the hand around and see if the motor is working. But distal sensory intact, I challenge you, go find somebody who knows the exact sensory distribution of the hand. So some clinical decision support, look right here, innervation of the hand. You never leave here. You don't go three seconds, five seconds, a minute to some other source. You don't need a username and password. You don't have to get on the Internet. Uh, the nerve distribution of the hand is immediately available. You never leave the user interface. This is the future. This is the losing frustration. This is improving workflow. This is making patients safer. Then a common, um, a common miss is, is tendon lacerations. Why are we missing tendon lacerations? Because we don't remember the tendons, and we don't remember how to examine them. So I want to check this box right here. I'm kind of re reminded to come here because there's a sort of a stoplight next to it. And I want to check that box. I want to say tendon function is normal because that's my job. That's a quality job. But truth be told, I don't remember the tendons or how to test them. 
Uh, and believe me, I'm not saying that because I'm a bad emergency physician. I'm telling you, 30,000 emergency physicians are all in the same boat. So just one click, and you're looking at the back of the hand, and there's all the tendons. If this is where the laceration is, one more click, and you're looking at how to examine that tendon. Clinical decision support, never having to leave, improving patient safety. Okay, this is just another couple of examples, again, just to get the wheels turning. And, and, and again, this speaks specifically to the frustration that, that practitioners express in working with electronic medical records. You fill in your history, right, in this associated with section right here. You fill in your history, and then that history should really talk to the review of systems. The history and the review of systems, the examination, and the procedures and interpretation should all talk to the medical decision making. There should be logic built inside of this electronic medical record. But generally speaking, most of the time, overwhelmingly, it's not. You do your history where you do these elements, and then you go to the review of systems and you do them again. What's the answer? Just have all of these talk to the review of systems. You do this because it's related to billing and coding, right? You've already done it in your history of present illness. Why do you do it here? It's related to billing and coding. Well, we haven't got time for that. You know, the workflow is critical. So let the history, let the chart talk to itself. Let history populate the review of systems. So here's another one. I mentioned all of this should talk to the med to medical decision making. I'm in a chest pain chart, patients over 40. I at least have to think about the possibility of thoracic aortic dissection, which I have in a box down here. So as I fill in the elements of history related to dissection, the elements of examination, the chest x-ray, they need to populate a note. This says that I don't need to think about dissection anymore, and here's why. You don't need to type this note. All you need to do is look when you get to medical decision making, press on TAD and see, yes, I've addressed the risks that would predispose, like a family history or connective tissue disease. I haven't ad addressed whether it was abrupt and onset. I have addressed the radiation or migration issue. I have addressed the cardiovascular exam and the pulse differential. I haven't addressed the chest x-ray. So back into the chart I go. If I had done all those things real, if I had done all the things ahead of time, this would have all been populated just like this, and you hit apply, and it's in your medical record. Basically, the, the history, the physical, should assist the practitioner in remembering these elements to address dissection. They should auto-check themselves, and when you put your note in, you don't have to edit it. You don't have to look to make sure that the canned text or the copy paste is okay because you generated that real time. You got here, you looked, you one click, and it is in your note. And that is the way that it should be. What you're looking at here is the evidence-based medicine to determine whether or not you can rule out a pulmonary embolism and do no further imaging, maybe discharge your patient. So I'm, I'm, I'm showing this because there's some important things to look at here. Here is the evidence base supported by the research algorithm. You're going to do a modified Wells, and if it's low, likely, low likelihood, you're going to do a PERC or you're going to do a D-dimer. And so do you remember, as a practicing physician, uh, do you re or advanced, practice, uh, advanced practitioner, do you remember this algorithm? Maybe, maybe not. It should be built in. And if you do, what are the elements of modified wells? What are the PERC criteria? I'm telling you, people are not doing this. This is not making it into the medical record. I'm not sure this level of quality is happening. There is a huge level of variability. This is what people should be doing to say there is, uh, I, I should be thinking about a PE or I don't need to be thinking about a PE. And nope. But to work with this, you need to pull something out of your pocket, log in, you need to get to the internet, username and password, go to pulmonary embolism, go to rule out logic. There, isn't enough, there are not enough minutes in the day and uh, you know, that's why people are going home and they're doing it at home at night. What do you need to do? You need to build this into your 
medical record. And so, uh, as I said, your chart should be helping you with those critical elements for dissection. The dissection risk factors are completed. The migration of pain is not. The key elements, uh, the aortic murmur, right? And this is helping you sort of with a barometer getting over here. So it's going to help you create, <clears throat> it's going to help you um, create that note. Um, <clears throat> but we're talking about evidence-based medicine for PE. So you see there's nothing in the incomplete for uh, evidence-based medicine for pulmonary embolism, right? All right, now we're going to tell the chart that, that there's something that should make the practitioner think about pulmonary embolism. Uh, so onset unknown, uh, pain since onset, it's substernal. I'm not thinking about pulmonary embolism yet. But then I get down to associated with leg pain and leg swelling, and look what happens. The PE evidence-based criteria just jumped into incomplete, and my barometer for risk and safety just went from yellow back to red. Hmm. Now, the history is also communicating with the medical decision-making. So where pulmonary embolism and the built-in algorithm are here, when, I, when uh, I indicate that there is a reason to be thinking about leg pain, leg swelling, okay, that turns that red. And that's when that jumps into this list, PE evidence-based criteria. So we've got, the, we've got the chart talking to itself, pulmonary embolism. Okay, now I need to do a modified wells. I don't want to leave, leave this user interface. I'm an MDM and I want to do evidence-based criteria, and I want to use ASEP level B, modified wells plus PERC. So I do my modified wells, uh, and then I'm going to do PERC. So here's the PERC rule, and, uh, and it opens up inside of my user interface. I don't have to leave. I don't have to go to the Internet. I don't have to find a calculator. It's built in. All right, that's one thing. That's huge. That improves workflow. It means that this is quality. This is a quality analysis getting done right here. Now, there's another thing. I've got vitals. I've got pulse docs, right? So the so the 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 pulse the pulse rate should talk to this calculator. The oxygen sat should talk to this calculator. Maybe prior history should talk to this calculator. It should self-populate. It should either go into a column so you can say yes, no, yes, no, or it should simply say yes. It should just simply automatically turn this into a yes, plus leave HR equal 120, so you know why that happened. <clears throat> so many ideas. This is so far afield from what you see in today's electronic medical records and electronic health records. So once I get to PERC and I say, yeah, no, 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 none of those elements are present. So my modified wells is low risk and my PERC is negative. I have just met the criteria for evidence-based analysis of pulmonary embolism. I've moved PE evidence-based criteria into the complete list. Uh, it's telling me my modified wells is zero, my perk is negative, and I hit apply, and it's dropping all of that into the medical record. This saves time. It improves workflow. It addresses the quality. It addresses patient safety. This is the direction that we need to go. Here's kind of a cool one. This is called neonatal uh, weight auto calculator. Uh, what's the issue here? The issue is you get a little one who comes in 10 days old, 15 days old, and one of the big issues, is this child sick or is this child well? One of the, one of the sort of fundamental ways you approach, uh, you approach neonates. And one of the key issues is, has this baby been gaining adequate weight? Well, what is an adequate weight gain in a neonate? Well, it's 30 to 50 grams per day. Um, but you don't know that. You don't work with that data. There isn't a program that automatically just tells you, this child isn't gaining enough weight, or this child is gaining enough weight. And so simply take the birth weight and, you know, have the nurse on intake add the current weight. And when it does that, it automatically does the calculation. It says there is an inadequate weight gain, and then there is a passive alert. You don't need to open it up. You don't need to go there. But now you have a piece of key information you didn't have before. And communication. The, these systems should help with communication. What happens here is that risk alert trans, transfers from the nursing user interface to the physician interface. And if the physician interface wants it, oops, 15 to 30. You see what I'm talking about? Human memory. I said 30 to 50 about two minutes ago. Right? And it's not. Okay, I need this, but I need this. The newborn should gain 15 to 30 grams of weight per day for the first few months of life. Um, so case in point, right? 
perfect. So neonatal weight auto calculator. And sort of the last thing I'll talk about is um, is that we as humans aren't really great dot connectors. If you look up into the sky and you see this, you know what that is? You know what that is. This is the Big Dipper. But, <clears throat> but um, would you be able to identify Scorpio or the, or the scales of justice? Probably not. They're not, you know, not without training your eye uh, because they are dots that are difficult to connect in the sky. So, too, are the elements of Kawasaki. So, too, you may not recognize um, the criteria for sepsis, even though that may be changing to QSOFA. So, too, the EMRs and EHRs need to keep up with new developments in the practice of medicine and evidence-based medicine. So what's the point here? The nurse may get a history of fever, and the physician might get the fact that there's adenopathy in the neck. There might be something in the EMS, EMT note. There might be, you know, the, from the physician's physical exam. Now, you, you need to do is recognize that there are several criteria for Kawasaki, a huge risk and safety issue for, for infants. And will we get this? It would be really nice to have a rule using a natural language processor that's looking for these elements uh, because the, the practitioner may simply not pick it up every time or it might be a PA or NP who don't have experience with Kawasaki syndrome. Not to belittle at all the incredibly valuable addition of advanced practitioners. Um, so when, the, when the, your EMR EHR recognizes those dots, uh, it fires a rule to let you know that you should be thinking about the possibility of Kawasaki. And just, be, just in case you haven't seen it or considered it in a long time, there are criteria for the disease. There's a quick consult. There's a differential diagnosis for the little ones. If you press on, I need more information on Kawasaki, there are the criteria immediately available inside the, human, the, um, inside the user interface. So I can't tell you about all the functionality we've worked on over the years, but I think it's clear that human factors engineering and other things that we can, other opportunities that we have in the EMRHR, can truly change the equation, can truly improve quality, uh, uh, evidence-based medicine built in, and it can improve our ability to recognize abnormal vital signs, quality, safety. Uh, these things can really change, and we need to get, you know, we, we all need to demand that the, that the organizations that create these systems for us are paying attention. Uh, to summarize, human factors engineering is one of many opportunities to impact the practitioner and patient experience. Correctly applied, it can improve quality and safety, and it can reduce medical errors. Correctly applied, it can deal with this problem of practitioner frustration. It can improve practitioner satisfaction. It is the future. It's going to happen. Let's get there. Let's get there as soon as possible. And once you get those wheels turning, it's really exciting. Uh, and the sky is the limit. So thank you um, very much. And because this is a recording, we can't do any Q and A, uh, which we did during the original uh, TSG XL Catlin presentation. But I hope you enjoyed this and. Uh, Always interested in, in hearing from you. If you have you know, any questions or thoughts or comments about this presentation, uh, please contact us at the, at the Sullivan Group, uh, and um, looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.